So we took a look at how to transform a normal flip-flop into a scan flip-flop. Now let's look at how the scan flip-flop can be used to uh, create a scan register, which is a multi-bit register specifically, and how that can be used to uh, increase controllability and observability within uh, chips containing synchronous pipelines. So this is a normal uh, like uh, four bit register. So it's a parallel register. That's what we mean by a multi bit register. It just accepts a multi bit input word and produces a multi bit output word synchronously. And this is how it looks when it is transformed into a scannable form so that every flip flop is replaced by a scannable flip flop. Now, each of the scannable flip flops is going to have a TDI input and a TDO output, as well as a test mode input. These are the three additional pins that a scannable register, a scannable flip flop has uh, over a normal flip flop. So the test inputs of each of the flip flops is going to be connected to a single test input. Uh, that is provided to the register as a whole. So the register as a whole has its input D, which is multi-bit, and its output Q, which is multi-bit, and the clock input. And these are the normal I.O. pins of the multi-bit register. It's also going to have three additional pins. So, no, you know, it doesn't scale up. You have three additional pins in a scannable register. You have uh, in a scannable flip-flop, you have three additional bits. In a 16-bit register, you have three additional uh, pins. In a 32-bit register, it's just three additional pins. And they are always TDI and test. And these are input pins. And TDO, which is a single output pin. So, this test input to the register is going to be distributed to all of the flip-flops. So, they all share the same test input, which means that they are, if they are set to test mode, they will all be set to test mode simultaneously. If they are set to normal mode, they will be all set to normal mode simultaneously. There's no way to set a specific bit in the register to test mode or normal mode, nor is there a need to. The TDI input of the uh, overall register is going to be provided to the TDI input of the first flip-flop in the register. And from then on, the TDO output of this first flip-flop is going to be provided to the TDI input of the next flip-flop. And so on and so forth. Each flip-flop hands its TDO to the TDI of the next flip-flop until we reach the last flip-flop in the register, which will provide its, its own TDO to the external TDO of the re register as a whole so that its TDO becomes the overall TDO of the register. So this scannable register obviously has two modes, a mode when the test signal is equal to zero and a mode when the test signal is equal to one. When the test signal is equal to zero, we are in normal mode. And in normal mode, each of the scannable flip-flops is going to uh, pass its D input to its Q output. The TDI inputs and the TDO outputs are not relevant when the test is equal to zero. And therefore, in normal mode, we're just going to observe the, uh, the register working, in, uh, working normally with uh, D inputs being passed to uh, Q outputs normally. In test mode, on the other hand, we will see the, uh, the scannable register uh, basically functioning as a shift register because each of the flip-flops is going to accept the TDI input and is going to pass out the TDI, TDO output. And therefore, um, we are going to see them operating as a shift register with the external input TDI being the input of the shift register and the external output TDO being the output of the shift register. And there are as many shifts within the register as there are bits in the original register. So this is when the test mode is equal to one. So now let's take a look at a uh, at an example and see how this uh, these scannable registers can be used to help us in testing. So this is the same chip, quote unquote. It's a very simple chip, of course. It consists of eight uh, CLBs um, in a synchronous pipeline 
Uh, there are specifically uh, three paths in this pipeline. Um, now, the modification that happens when you apply the scan technique is that every register is going to be replaced by a scannable register. And again, each of these registers, um, R1 through uh, R node 2, means that we are using a multi-bit register similar to this, uh, with the two modes being similar to, uh, to the situation we showed above. Uh, there's also going to be something called the scan path, which is shown dotted here, so that your placement and routing tool is going to route your circuit normally, and this is shown using the solid lines, um, and we use the name data path for this in the legend, but there's also an additional path that the routing tool creates called the scan path. As you can see, the scan path accepts an input from the chip, and uh, this is an external pin, it's an input to the chip, and it's called TDI. And then it routes it so that it becomes the input, the TDI input of the first register. And then it takes the TDO output of the first register and routes it to the TDI input of the next register, and so on. And you'll see that the dotted line actually forms a loop through the entire chip from the first register R1 to the very last register R02. At the very last register R02, its own output TDO is going to be provided to an output pin for the chip, also called TDO. There's also a test input to the chip, and that test input is disseminated to all the registers in the circuit. So when we talked about the test input, for the scannable register, we said that all the scannable flip-flops will share the same test input. No, no, no. It's all the registers in the circuit are actually going to have the same test mode control signal. It's just a single bit that is provided to all of them. It's also, this TDI is also a single bit, and this TDO is also a single bit. So this mechanism, this setup for, for, incre for testing, is only going to add three pins to the chip, TDI, TDO, and test. So it's only three pins. These three pins are going to be uh, distributed to all the registers, where all the registers also have an additional three inputs and outputs. And then within the registers, each of the scannable flip-flops also has three additional ports. So the number three here is key because uh, there's all, only a single test data input, single test data output, and a single test signal. And again, TDI is a single bit. It's a single pin. And TDO is a single bit. We're not talking about a bus here. So the cost of this technique in terms of the, the number of pins is, is really great because it's only three pins. And it really doesn't matter how big or deep your circuit is it's always going to be three pins. There's, of course, a cost that is paid when you try to test more complicated circuits, and we will discover this shortly. So, in short, the circuit is modified so that every register is replaced by a scannable register. There's an additional path shown here dotted, which basically loops through all the scannable registers so that the test data output of one becomes the test data input of the other and the very first test data input is uh, obtained from the input pin the tdi the very last tdo is provided to the output pin tdo there's also a test mode signal which is provided to all the registers in the circuit uh, it's not shown here but it is you know it is something that you need to know so how can this be used to increase testability for the circuit? Recall that our problem is that modules within the chip did not have, we did not, we did not have full controllability or observability. So for module 2, for example, we didn't have uh, observability on its output or controllability on its input. And in a, in a realistic chip, you're also going to have, your, of course, going to have much deeper pipelines with much deeper nodes. You need to have controllability and observability on these nodes so that you can test each of these modules independently. Because if you see a problem with your chip, you need to be able to tell which part of the chip is causing this problem. So how does this work? Well, what happens first is that we set the test signal to 1. So that test 
test mode signal is set to 1, which indicates that we are in test mode. This is disseminated to all the registers in the circuit. This causes all the registers to work this way, to become shift registers. And you can also see that each of these registers will then be connected in sequence to the register after it, so that we end up with this situation where each of the registers is working as a shift register, but it is also connected to the next register. So that from TDI to TDO, you observe a very long shift register, a shift register that includes all the registers in the circuit. So now all of the registers are connected to each other, forming one gigantic shift register. Then we have our test vector prepared. What's our test vector? Our test vector is basically what we wish to have, the contents we wish to have in each of the registers, R1 through uh, R8. So what do you wish these registers to contain? Specifically, what do I mean by this? You, we had a problem, which is that we didn't have controllability over this node, for example. So if you did have controllability on it, on it you would be able to set the contents of R2 to your liking. That would mean that you can set the inputs of module 2 to something that you want to set them to, right? So what you want to do next is to have a very long test vector. And this is a serialized um, binary vector that contains all the bits that you wish would end up being in all of these registers. And then you start feeding this test vector through TDI and you apply cycles, enough cycles so that this whole test vector shifts through this humongous shift register and settles in all of these registers R1 through R8. Once you have done that, you now have basically control over all of the states of all of the registers. Then you can switch to test mode equals zero. When you do that, you go back to the normal operation of the circuit and all of the registers are operating in parallel, feeding their inputs to the CLBs. And you apply a single clock cycle. So when you do that, the CLBs will accept the inputs in the registers. These inputs are inputs that you put there manually. They are not the inputs that you would observe in normal operations. So you know what you provided to each of the CLBs. Now the CLBs are going to provide outputs to their output registers and these outputs will be registered in the output registers. So we switch back to test mode again. And now we do have the outputs that we need. Let's say that we have the output that we need in R3, but we don't have access to R3 except we have switched to test mode and now we do have access to R3. We can simply obtain the, uh, the contents of R3 by applying clock cycles so that the, uh, the contents of the, of, the, of the registers shift out of TDO. And we can register them as they are shifted out of TDO. We can take them and analyze them. Meanwhile, as we are shifting out the outputs from TDO, we can also apply a new input to TDI because Remember that testing isn't done by applying a single input to a module. You need to apply multiple inputs so that you can figure out what exactly is the problem. So that now you have full control and full observation power on every single CLB in the circuit. The main problem with this, the main cost with it is the latency. The deeper the pipeline, the longer the shift register that you have and the more cycles you need to apply in order to shift in the test vectors and shift out the observation vectors. So what we do sometimes is that we uh, divide the circuit into subsystems from the point of view of design for testability, and each of them could have its own uh, TDI, TDO, and test inputs and its own scan path. This will shorten the scan path by reducing it to a single uh, subsystem or submodule, but of course it comes at the expense of additional pins because you will need three pins, uh, three additional pins per each module. Uh, we can also multiplex 
these uh, inputs between the submodules. Um, this way, we can reduce the number of, of pins again down to three, and perhaps with a few select lines to allow us to pick between the submodules. The cost here is that we can only test one submodule at a time. But the benefit is that the depth of each of the pipelines is reduced, reducing the latency of our testing.